<laughs> well, praise God. Our key text is Psalm 119, 18. Open thou mine eyes, <laughs> that I may behold wondrous things out of thy law. The purpose of our study through the book of Psalms is that we may learn to praise God and pray to Him. Now, Psalm 5, which is all we're going to get to tonight, <laughs> we may be at this about three years. <laughs> well, 52 weeks in a year, and if we do one Psalm a week, that's, uh, yeah, about three years. That's okay. It doesn't matter, because God can teach us everything we need to know from this, what we've already know, heard is that little Bible. It's a, it's a little copy, or if you will, of the Old Testament. So this is a, considered a morning prayer, and uh, we're going to compare this to the Lord's Prayer as we go through it. And uh, to do so, we're going to look at Matthew chapter 6. Let's all turn there together. Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 through 15. Verse 9, After this manner therefore pray ye, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. For if ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Now the author of Psalm 5 is David. And the theme is a righteous man prays that God will destroy his wicked enemies. But before we get to that piece, there are some pertinent points to be made in this psalm. And we'll begin with verse 1 through 3. Again, we see in the superscription that the, this is a... Psalm to the chief musician upon Nihaloth, a psalm of David. David says, Give ear to my words, O Lord. Consider my meditation. Hearken unto the voice of my cry, my King and my God. For unto thee will I pray. My voice shalt thou hear in the morning, O Lord. In the morning will I direct my prayer unto thee, and will look up. Now the first three verses lay the foundation of how the righteous will approach God in prayer. Give ear to my words, O Lord, consider my meditation, hearken unto the voice of my cry, my King and my God, for unto thee will I pray. Our Heavenly Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom. So we're directing our prayer toward God in heaven. Amen? David petitions the Lord to hear his prayer. He clearly identifies the Lord as my King. Heavenly Father, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy... We're petitioning, we're saying he is king, right, right there in the Lord's Prayer. The attitude, he's also saying he's his God as he prays. This attitude is what makes David righteous in the eyes of the Lord. He places God in the appropriate position of king and Lord. Remember, Christ had not died for the sins of the world at, this time, at the time of this prayer. And the only way for men to be righteous was to understand that God was God. And make the appropriate sacrifices to him. Think, think the law. Think the law of Moses. They had specific sacrifices for specific things that they had to follow. That's why Christ was the perfect sacrifice. And he ended all of that. Because his perfect blood was shed once and for all, the scripture tells us. Praise God. David also promises God that he will hear his voice. David's voice. In other words, God, you will hear my voice. As he prays each morning, God, you will hear my voice when I pray each morning. Essentially, David is asking God to hear the prayer he prays each morning as he prays to the one he considers King and God. However, David does not leave off at praying. Indeed, he tells God he will look up in anticipation of an answer to his prayers. O Lord, in the morning will I direct my prayer unto thee, and I will look up. <laughs> that means we're not just saying, oh, oh well, woe is me, Lord, would you do this? And we're just going on about our business. No, we pray and we say, okay. We away. 
we await. So we pray and we await. We await what? An answer from God. He will answer us and let us know He's heard our petition. Not that He's going to do exactly what we want right then, but He's heard our petition and He will deal with what we've petitioned Him about. Verses 4 through 7, For thou art not a God that hath pleasure in wickedness, neither shall evil dwell with thee. The foolish shall not stand in thy sight. Thou hast all, thou hatest all workers of iniquity. Thou shalt destroy them that speak leasing. The Lord will abhor the bloody and deceitful man. But as for me, I will come into thy house in the multitude of thy mercy. And in thy fear will I worship toward thy holy temple. Now David begins here to expound upon who God is and what he likes and dislikes. In doing so, he, David, makes a clear distinction between the wicked and the righteous. Notice the wicked will not dwell with the Lord. We talked about this some last week. However, the righteous will. Here, the wicked are those who work iniquity. Those that lie. Remember, last week we talked about leasing is lying. And the deceitful. Here, the righteous come into the house of the Lord by His mercy. Consider this in terms of prophecy. Because of God's greatest act of mercy, sending His only begotten Son to die for the sins of mankind, we are now able to enter into the house of the Lord. Now, fear... These are the righteous also fear the Lord with a reverential fear, which leads to worship. And I want to make a special note here. Notice the worship is directed where? To God, not to man. You know, I believe all across the land there are people gathering together and they're worshiping one another or their abilities. You know, a pastor mentioned it in his sermon this past Sunday. It's not about our harmonizing and our abilities. It's about what we're doing. We're praising and worshiping our God and, and imploring those around us to do the same with us. That's what praise and worship really is. Verse 8, Lead me, O Lord, in thy righteousness because of mine enemies. Make thy way straight before my face. Now the psalm turns toward the root of the petition. So now he's identified who he's talking to and he's talked about worship and he's talked about the wicked and the righteous and how the righteous are going to worship now he's turning towards what he's going to ask god the psalm turns towards david asking god to lead him on the right path how many of you found yourself needing to know what the right path is more so every day as it grows darker in the world right well, he asked God to make this path straight before his face. In other words, David desires that God illuminate the proper way for him to proceed amidst the enemies which have arisen around him. Remember now, this is shortly after David. Most believe this psalm was written shortly after the betrayal by Absalom. So this is still fresh in David's mind as he's dealing with what path do I follow, Lord? And in our situation... Asking God for illumination of our path is the only way that we will survive. Now, you might say, well, we may not survive. That's true. We know, there's no guarantee of tomorrow. That's why the Lord tells us to be ready. This is the day of salvation. So, but if we're going to walk and do His will, we must be on the path He would have us on. If we're going to survive that mission. Amen. You know, it's like in the military, if, if, you're not on the, if you're not in the appropriate place, the appropriate time, you have no, you have no um, air support. You're not going to have artillery being able to dial in and help you out in a, in a, and when you're in a pickle. Why? Because you've, you've, you have uh, deviated from the path you were supposed to be on. And without proper communication, they have no way of knowing that. Now, God may cause us to deviate from what we which way we were traveling. But that's his call, because he may see something, an obstacle, or an opportunity over here that we didn't see. The obstacle may be in the path we're on, he wants us to avoid, or he may send us elsewhere. So that's why we must be like Gumby, and be flexible to God's will, not ours. <laughs> so, sorry. <laughs> uh, 
Now, you know, I've talked often about the song, God's way is the right way to do everything. You know, his way is the right way. Come on and listen to him. God's word is filled with all we will ever need. God's way is the right way to do what? Everything. You mean everything? I mean everything. You know, if David hadn't been on the rooftop, if he'd have been out with his men like he should have been, I'm just saying. Now, am I accusing David? No, God gave us that example. So we could say things like that and learn from it because guess what? David repented. So in terms of God holding it against him, it's, just, it's removed as far as the east is from the west. However, God taught us through his example what we should and should not do. Amen. Verse 9, for there is no faithfulness in their mouth. He's talking about the wicked now. In their inward part is very wickedness. Their throat is an open sepulcher. They flatter with their tongue. Now David begins to describe and or identify the traits of the wicked. They are unfaithful with their mouths. Nothing they say can be trusted. Have y'all ever dealt with somebody that's a liar? Well, you don't know if it's, if it might sound real good, but it's still a lie. So you really can't trust anything they say. It's like the old boy, when the, the boy cried wolf. Well, I guess what he was doing every time he said the wolf was there when it wasn't. He was leasing or lying. And therefore, when the wolf actually came, nobody believed him. The wicked are wicked on the inside. Destruction lies within them. Notice David says, there is no faithfulness in their mouth, followed by the statement that their inward parts are wickedness. Consider this in the light of this passage. Luke 6.45 says, A good man out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is good. And an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is evil. For out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks, or speaketh as the King James says. You know, this is unavoidable. This will happen. You can, uh, you can talk to somebody who does certain things all the time, and guess what comes out of their mouth? That certain thing. Whether it's cars, sports, uh, adventures, whether it's reading, whether it's study of Revelation and in the end times, you know, or like Rhapsody, it's always about dealing with this, the flesh and the Walking in the Spirit. So that's what comes out because guess what? That's what God's putting in. Now, if somebody's not saved, they can put in things that are actually wicked. Okay? And that's why Rhapsody's been talking for several weeks now about avoiding those types of circumstances and people. Why? Because it'll rub off on you. Now all of a sudden you're hearing the wicked. What abundance of the mouth of heart to mouth speaketh faith comes by hearing hearing by the word so if we begin to believe things because we hear them isn't it appropriate that we might begin to hear somebody say rise up against the evil that's in our nation and next thing you know we start hearing that everywhere next thing you know that sounds like a good thing to do but that's exactly opposite of what god showed us to do so that's why it's very important that we Especially now. That's why we gather even more. That's why we look up even more. That's why we read and study and pray even more. Why? Because we know that everywhere you listen and look, it's wicked. Sorry. And I'm going to say this because it's the truth. Many of the pulpits today that you're going to see on TV and across the radio, they're wicked. How do you know they're wicked? Because what they say does not line up with God's word. They will take a scripture. And remember we talked months and months ago about how we study. We study by reading something and determining its context. What did it say in context? What was God really saying? Because remember, we, we read the word of God because it's God's word. We don't read the word of God because man has interpreted it a certain way and we're going to listen to what man says. No, we're going to listen to God's word and try to determine exactly what he meant for us to hear. And we do that by studying in context. 
And I'm not going to give examples tonight because I don't want your mind going there, but there are many who take a single scripture out of its context and they make a doctrine out of it. And they fill the airways and then people are, just like we talked about, beguiled by the false. And next thing you know, everywhere they look, that's what they hear. That's what. And then at some point they say, oh, I sure like hearing that. And now they begin to heap to themselves teachers because their ears have begun to itch. And next thing you know, they're not even listening to God anymore. They're listening to that person. And then when something does arise that makes them doubt what they're hearing, they have to go to the person to say, now, wait a minute, I see a problem here. And the person straightens them out, doesn't it, don't they? Now, listen, here's what that really means. But that's, their, that's the word according to them. Now, what God said, study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needs not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. You've heard that over and over and over and over and over, and you'll continue to hear it. Why? Because that's what God wants us to do, especially in this hour. Because we must know what's coming upon us. Otherwise, we will be swept away in the tide of the wicked. Not because we want to be, but because we've been beguiled. Remember, Adam and Eve were made by God, and he said all things that he had made were good. And a matter of fact, when he finished, he said it was very good, and they were still beguiled by listening to the wicked one. Don't even entertain his, his lips. He starts talking, you start walking the other way. Submit yourself to God, resist him, and he will flee. The word sepulcher is another word for grave. Therefore, the wicked are prepared to swallow up their prey with the lies they speak and bring them to the grave. These lies are noted by the statement, flatter with their tongue, which is another way of saying with lies or deceit. Perhaps the best example of the wicked is Satan. Think of how his deceit in the garden has actually affected all of mankind since then. That's a, been a sin that's perpetuated over and over and over and over. And now, from that time till now, you've always had men and or women that wanted to be God. Well, I'm self-made. Are you? <laughs> I'm so sorry. That's what we ought to say when they say that. I'm sorry. You mean, you mean you didn't let God help you at all? Just ask the simple question. That, that's like a basketball player. I just threw the ball to the other person. Now they're thinking, oh, well, you know, I, I, no, I didn't. They might just start considering that and start to study to show themselves approved. Or they may begin to ask you questions, and you, where are you going to point them? To your special pet doctrine? No, you're going to point them right here to the Word. Amen? Verse 10, David says, Destroy them, O God. Let them fall by their own counsels. Cast them out in the multitude of their transgressions, for they have rebelled against thee. <laughs> now David turns the corner of his prayer, and now it becomes an imprecation. Remember what we talked about, an imprecation is when we ask God to deal with somebody or to judge them or to bring calamity upon them. That's when we take it to God and say, please do this, but you do it. I'm not going to get involved. I'm not going to do it. I'm asking you to do it, God. David, he turns the corner. It becomes an imprecation. Reminder, an imprecation is the act of imploring God to deal with the wicked. Remember, the main difference between David and many of today's false prophets is his desire. He desired that God deal with the wicked. They want you to rise up and deal with the wicked. Now, if you read any, uh, I, I don't read, I don't get into detail anymore with the news. or anything. I just read the little blurbs and I'll read a few comments. And you'll see in the comments, there are people in the comments that are fomenting rebellion. And I'll tell you who they are. They're probably not godly. And they want this. Remember, the enemy, I believe he wants this. He wants this war in which he, because remember, out of chaos comes order. That's their belief system. So they, they have to have chaos so they can have order. And uh, we're the opposite. We want order that has no chaos because there's one order for us. 
And that's through following Christ, we now have unity. There's our order. Because He's doing what? He's directing our path and leading us the way we should go each and every day. We follow His way, not our way. That's how we have unity, because He knows what each one of us, all members of the same body, need to be doing at the same time. I'm going to play the pioneer. These ten finger, well, eight fingers, two thumbs, they need to be able to work well together. Now, Lord, you know you can help me there. I'm imploring you, Lord. Everybody else is too. Oh, thank you, Lord. Now notice here that these, these lying prophets, they're calling for men to do this. God is not in this. Flee from these scoundrels before they bring eternal damnation upon your head. If you're out there listening to me, flee from these scoundrels. They're liars. And some of them, we've been hearing their name for many, many years from the pulpit. I'm going to tell you right now, if they're out there telling you to rise up, and not in the way that God would have us rise up. We wrote a song. Rapsy wrote a song just like Miss Carista. She woke up out of her sleep and began to write the song. And it was Rise Up Church. You're the light to a lost and dying world. You're the vessel that carries God's word. Oh, it's about sharing God's word. It's about being salt, about being light. It's not about taking up arms and trying to deal with our country. If they're calling you to rise up, flee from them. They're a scoundrel. Don't care what their name is. Don't care their PhDs, their doctrines after their name. It's not in God's Word. Therefore, they are warring against God. Now, David, notice how he has the, he has the holy God to destroy the wicked. God, you destroy the wicked. He also asked God to allow them to come to ruin by their own counsel. And that they may be cast out because of their continuing sinful nature, which they have embraced instead of God. This is exactly what will happen in the coming tribulation. The wicked will devise a plan to control everything and everyone. The problem they have is they are part of the everyone. Noted here. And their own devices will eventually bring them to the eternal damnation they deserve. We saw over an extensive study, eight and a half months through the book of Revelation, these wicked will get their due. And guess who brings it? God. Of course, He uses certain circumstances and, and even men to bring about it. Remember, we, taught, we, heard about, we read about and studied that the whore of Babylon would actually be destroyed by the ten kings whom God uses for His purpose, though they don't know it. <laughs> they think they're just doing what they, they do. Well, remember, the devil is God's devil. We're going to talk about Job here in a minute. And uh, he even had to ask for my permission to, to deal with that. I'm not, going to, I'm not going to steal the thunder that's coming. Verses 11 and 12. But let all those that put their trust in thee rejoice. Let them ever shout for joy. Because thou defendest them, let them also that love thy name be joyful in thee. For thou, Lord, wilt bless the righteous. With favor wilt thou compass him with, as with a shield. Now David turns the corner from imprecation to a petition to, uh, for the righteous in which he asked the Lord to allow those who trust in him to what? Shout for joy, because the great I am is their defense. Be joyful in him. Loving God's name could be better said, loving God's authority or kingship. That's what... In the name of Jesus, it's His kingship, His authority that we're operating in. It's not about us. If it becomes about us, guess what? It doesn't work. You go try to plug 220 into a 110 outlet. It's not going to work. Because that greater power can't flow through the, the lesser out, outlet. We're the lesser outlet. Not that God won't use us to shine the light. He said we are the light of the world. We're salt. But we're not Him. We're his vessels. That he is, we are filled with him. He has filled us by his spirit. And from us emanates life, literally. Because as we begin to walk in his anointing and speak his word, hearts can be changed. But that's the only way. And it's not going to be by 357 Magnum or, 40, or 38 Special or 45. Knock them down. That's not going to be the way God does it. 
That's the way the devil does it, by the way. That's the way the enemies of God have always done it, by force. Now David closes this psalm with an affirmation of God's attitude toward the righteous. David notes that God will bless the righteous. He also indicates that God will literally encompass the righteous with favor, likened to a shield. This is exactly what we see in the narrative about Job. In fact, Satan identified this shield of favor as the only reason that Job served God. <laughs> Satan was wrong. Let's go to Job chapter 1. Job chapter 1. Y'all there? I was on the wrong side of the river. Job chapter 1. <laughs> Beginning of verse 6. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Doth Job fear God for naught? Hast not thou made a hedge about him? Can you hear him now? He's a little insolent, petulant thing himself. And about his house and about all that he hath on every side. Thou hast blessed the work of his hands and his substance is increased in the land. But put forth thine hand now and touch all that he hath and he will curse thee to thy face. Huh. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, all that he hath is in thy power. Only upon him put not forth thine hand. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. And there was a day when his sons and his daughters were eating and drinking wine in the eldest brother's house. And there came a messenger unto Job and said, The oxen were plowing and the asses feeding beside them. And the Sabaeans fell upon them and took them away. Yea, they have slain the servants with the edge of the sword. And I only am escaped alone to tell thee. While he was yet speaking, there came another he said, the fire of God is falling, falling from heaven and has burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them. And I only am escaped to tell thee. While he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, the Chaldeans came out, came out three bands and fell upon the camels and have carried them away. Yea, and slain the servants with the edge of the sword. And I only am escaped alone to tell thee. While he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, thy sons and thy daughters were eating and drinking wine. In the eldest brother's house, and behold, there came a great wind from the wilderness and smote the four corners of the house, and it fell upon the young men, and they are dead. And I only am escaped alone to tell thee. Then Job arose and rent his mantle and shaved his head and fell down upon the ground and worshipped. Oh. oh, and sake said, Naked I came out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this, Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. Wow. Huh. And we have people out there telling us, you better go pick up your sword. You better start doing something. No, we better start worshiping. We better start falling down on our face and saying, Lord, help us. Lord, you are mighty. Lord, you are good. Lord, you are worthy. Lord, you are able. Lord, you are. You are. He says of himself, I am. We say to him, you are. Yes. 
Now, to set the stage, well, we're going to go to, uh, to Job chapter 27 here in a minute and take a brief detour to look at an imprecation that Job uttered. But to set the stage, God testified that Job was a righteous man. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth, a perfect and upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil? Huh. Now let's turn to Job 27. Now, not, get, not getting into great deal, we're not studying the book of Job at the moment, but in the midst of this trial, next thing you know, three of Job's friends show up. I call them the useless counselors. They came and gave him horrible advice. And in this, in the midst of this, Job kept countering their statements. And he would continue to affirm his integrity. And that's what Job 27 begins with, an affirmation of his integrity. Moreover, Job continued his parable and said, As God liveth, who has taken away my judgment, and the Almighty who hath vexed my soul, all the while my breath is in me, and the Spirit of God is in my nostrils, my lips shall not speak wickedness, nor my tongue utter deceit. God forbid that I should justify you, Till I die, I will not remove my integrity from me. In other words, I'm not going to say I'm not integral. I am. And when we realize what God has actually said about Job, we realize he's right. God did say he was a just, a perfect and upright man. <laughs> the only one on the planet at that time. Of course, when you read the narrative, Job did do the sacrifices for even for his children. So he was living by the law and he was doing it perfectly. So don't, get, don't be mistaking what I said, that, that he was righteous in a, in a, of himself. Okay, he had a manner to be righteous. Our righteousness is in Christ. So Job was righteous by way of the law. He said, God forbid that I should justify you till I die. I will not remove my integrity from me. My righteousness I hold fast. And will not let it go. My heart shall not reproach me as long as I live. He's, so he's saying that, not only is, is Job saying that he won't reproach himself for how he has lived. He's saying, for as long as I do live, I will live this way. And I will continue to be to a, a man of integrity and be perfect before God. Wow. What does that mean? That means Job has decided long ago... To yield his will to God's will and do things God's way. That's the only way you could have this testimony of God saying you're perfect. Now Job turns to the state of the godless. Let mine enemies be as the wicked, and he that riseth up against me as the unrighteous. For what is the hope of the hypocrite? Though he hath gained when, he, when God taketh away his soul. Now, uh, I, I put an asterisk there, Matthew 16, 26, Mark 8, 26. I want you to think about this passage as you go through that same statement. For what is a man profited, it's down at the bottom of your sheet, if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his own soul? So here Job knew this long before it was ever uttered in the New Testament. I'll read that verse 8 again. For what is the hope of the hypocrite, though he hath gained... Now, he didn't say the whole world. When God taketh away his soul. It's the same essence of the same statement. Verse 9, will God hear his cry when trouble cometh his, upon him? Will he delight himself in the Almighty? Will he always call upon God? Now, he's talking about the wicked and saying, will he? Will he? Because guess what Job does? He, call, he calls upon God, the Almighty. He delights himself in the Almighty. Think, think Daniel, even when told not to, three times a day he opened his window and he prayed because God was more important to him than anything, even a decree that was going to send him to the lion's den. Verse 11, I will teach you by the hand of God that which is, which is with the Almighty, what will I not conceal? I will read that again. I will teach you by the hand of God that which is with the Almighty, will I not conceal? Behold, all ye yourselves have seen it. Why then are you thus altogether vain? 
This is the portion of a wicked man with God and the heritage of oppressors, which they shall receive of the Almighty. If his children, now this is what they're going to receive, these wicked. If their children be multiplied, it's for the sword. And if his offspring shall not be satisfied, and his offspring will not be satisfied with bread. In other words, you can't please them. Those that remain of him shall be buried in death, and his widows shall not weep. <laughs> in other words, when he dies, they're not going to care. See ya. Wouldn't want to be ya. <laughs> Though he heap up silver as the dust and prepareth raiment as the clay, he may prepare it, but the just shall put it on, and the innocent shall divide the silver. He buildeth his house as a moth, and as a booth that the keeper maketh. The rich man shall lie down, but he shall not be gathered. He openeth his eyes, and he is not. Means he won't be gathered unto the Lord. At that time, being gathered to the bosom of Abraham. Terrors, verse 20, terrors take hold on him as waters. A tempest stealeth him away in the night. <laughs> terrors take hold of him on the waters. A tempest stealeth him away in the night. This person, the wicked, are not... They're not blessed. They're on, the, they're on the opposite end of that spectrum. The, the east wind carrieth him away, and he departeth. And as a storm hurleth him out of his place. For God shall cast upon him and not spare. He would fain flee out of his hand. Men shall clap their hands at him and shall hiss him out of his place. Wow. Do we want to be the wicked? I don't think so. And then consider that in light of what we studied about the great tribulation that's coming. It's going to be bad, bad, bad. Amen? Praise God. So we will pick up next week, hopefully on, on Psalm chapter 6. Now I want you to open your, uh, well, just turn your page. I want to read an article that was birthed out of this study. And I don't know if the Lord's going to do this every week or not, but He did this week. And when I was reading about Job and this, the shield, and then I looked at what David said in the psalm about the shield of favor, it just struck me. So we have now a direct attack on our shield of favor. Now Job's misfortune is a great example of what Satan is doing right now to those who put their trust in God. Job was a man whose faith in God was so complete that God himself had this testimony about him. There is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and eschewest evil. Now the audience of God's testimony was Satan, who replied that Job was only faithful because God had placed a hedge about him and all that pertained to him. And David, in the fifth psalm, likened this hedge unto a shield of favor, which encompasses the righteous. Therefore, Satan has launched a direct attack on our shield of favor, just like he did to Job. Today, Satan desires to sift the children of God, just like he sifted Job and another believer, Peter. In that narrative, we saw that Peter was, the devil desired to sift him, and Jesus had a statement for Peter. However, he, first, he must first overcome the shield of favor God has around the righteous, the faithful ones. Thus, the current conditions of the world are indeed a direct attack on our shield of favor. Let's begin by defining the righteous. Habakkuk indicates the just shall live by faith in Habakkuk 2.4. Another word for just is righteous. And these are they that, according to Habakkuk, live by faith. Paul quotes Habakkuk when he describe, when describing those who live by faith are made righteous, whether Jew or Gentile. Romans 1, 16 and 17. Elsewhere, Paul teaches that no one is justified by the law. Instead, he once again notes that the just shall live by faith. Faith is what made Job and the rest of the hall of faithful ones justified, righteous, before God, Hebrews chapter 11. We who are alive and remain are justified by this same faith. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, Ephesians 2.8. Therefore, it is possible for sinful man to become righteousness of God through faith in Christ Jesus. 
Now let us define a faithful one. Perhaps the best place to look is in the text already presented. In Job 1.8, God said Job was unique on the earth. He was perfect and upright, and he feared God and eschewed evil means he turned away from evil. This is exactly what the Christian becomes when Christ is accepted as Savior and Lord. Immediately after one realizes they are justified by faith in Christ, the now resident Holy Spirit begins the work of sanctification, which causes the believer to act just like Job and many other great examples in the Bible. It should not surprise us that our mortal enemy, who walks about seeking whom he may devour, according to 1 Peter 5.8, desires to sift us like he did Job and Peter. Peter, when tested, failed miserably. He even denied Christ three times. However, he had a special advocate in Jesus who prayed that Peter's faith would not fail him and that, when he, that he would even strengthen his brothers when he returned. Thankfully, Jesus now sits at the right hand of the Father as an advocate who intercedes for you and me. We see that in Hebrews 4.15, Colossians 3.1, and Romans 8.34. Now we turn to the crux of this discussion. What can we discern from what happened to Job? Satan was correct about God placing a hedge around Job and all that pertained to him. Just like we are hedged about with favor, because we, like Job, love good and abhor and shun evil. Therefore, he must first have the hedge removed by God, as it was in the case of Job, or he must do the undoable and remove the hedge himself. This task is actually impossible, since God is God. Knowing this, what is his alternative? Ah, there it is. He must attack all of the things by which God brings us favor. If you think about it, this makes perfect sense. After all, if you cannot bring harm directly on the favored, just harm the shield of favor itself. Looking back over the last several decades alone provides plenty of affirmation of this theory. First, the enemy goes after God's word in schools, 1962. Next, he goes after prayer in schools, 1963. Before long, without God as the central influence in society, he goes after the unborn, our greatest possible blessing in 1973. Since then, many other events have transpired which have done harm to the shield of favor God has placed around His faithful ones. Incredibly, the last two years have been perhaps the greatest assault yet as the entire globe has come under the sway of the power elites who desire to reset all that we know to something else they will label the new normal. We must not miss the great irony involved here. The scriptural term, the just shall live by faith, is more than just a platitude. Indeed, this statement is the way of life for the faithful, no matter the circumstance. In fact, if we take a look at the faithful of the past, hardship only made them more faithful. Job, for instance, was told by his wife to curse God and die. He then dialogued with his so-called friends at great length while they provided worthless counsel intended, intended to cause Job to repent. Through it all, Job professed his innocence before God and maintained his faithfulness. He even said, though he slay me, yet will I trust in him, but I will maintain my own ways before him. Remember, Job's going to live till his end, the way he's lived. And that's the same way he gained that great testimony of God. This is quite a promise made by Job. He is essentially saying he will trust God no matter what transpires in his life, even death. He also tells his counselors that he will continue living in the manner which he has always lived. Remember, God called Job, Job perfect and upright, which means Job was essentially attacked by Satan because he was living a righteous life and God knew he would not falter. This leads our discussion to another promise which is crucial to understanding why our shield of favor is under attack. God promised the believer that He would never leave nor forsake us. This promise is made to all who believe the Son of God died for their sins, that was the blood atonement, was raised again, the first fruits of resurrection, and ascended to heaven where He prepares a place for us, the bride. The reason this promise is crucial is this. God, in the form of the Holy Spirit, now resides in the heart of every believer. Therefore, Satan would have to literally overcome God in order to overcome the believer. 
Since Satan cannot, cannot accomplish this, he is simply attacking all the things which God has declared as favor for the believer. You might ask why so, why so many believers have been persecuted and even slain in the incept, since the inception of the church. After all, if God indwells men, how can anyone or anything overcome them? The simple answer is that God never promised us that we would not suffer persecution or even death. In fact, he said the opposite would be the lot of the faithful. Matthew 5.10, Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Now, let's, I'm going to stop the article there for a second. Think about that. Blessed are they that are persecuted for what? For righteousness sake. For theirs is the kingdom. Of, they are in the kingdom of God because they are righteous. Why? Because they trust in God. In our dispensation, it's because we trust that Jesus died for us and God raised him from the dead. It's grace. And it's our, we are saved by, by grace through what? Faith. So through faith, we, under, we have now entered into this place where we will be persecuted for that. Because people hate us because of that. Matthew 5, 11 and 12. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you. <laughs> uh, I'll stop the article again. We were getting out of the army. We told them, hey, the Lord called us out of the army. They took me to the sergeant major, and I told the, the first sergeant, I said, hey, um, you know, I don't care if he reduces me to E1. I'm getting out. The Lord told me to get out. I'm getting out. He said, now don't say that to the sergeant major, who had the power, by the way, to at least recommend that. And uh, when I get to the sergeant major, he says, hey, Sergeant Adams, uh, you know, you're a nice guy and all, you know, uh, but I think your religious fanaticism has clouded your judgment. And I felt this scripture come to life in me as I left his office. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Persecuted for righteousness sake. Because he was essentially saying, hey, dummy. I'm going to say this nicely, but uh, you got it all wrong. No, God told me to do this. And you're a man. And I didn't say that to him. I just, I was nice. <laughs> Rejoice and be exceedingly glad for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. <laughs> uh, 2 Timothy 3.12. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ shall suffer persecution. Now, are you an all that, live, that wants to live godly in Christ, Jesus? Yeah, you're going to suffer persecution. Sorry about that. Uh, do you notice that when you got saved at your list of friends, uh, they, they, do, they, they reduced to almost nothing? Well, guess what? Now we're coming of the age where those friends are not, no, no, no longer friends. They're becoming enemies. Because after all, you're the problem. Because it's your staunch belief and your, your rigor, your, your inability to bend and to accept all these new things that are coming upon the earth, that's what's causing all the problems, after all. No, I'm just believing God's God and His, His ways are right. The way it's always been. But the enemies are rising. How do we deal with it? If you look back at last week, we stand down and look up. This week, we realize that the shield, literally the shield of favor that God has given us as each individual believer is being attacked. Well, incredibly, when God's word is correctly understood, persecution is actually a sign that the persecuted are the godly ones who desire God more than the things of this earth. Therefore, like Job, these believers are willing to die for their faith. This would seem to argue against the narrative of this discussion that Satan cannot destroy the shield of favor which encompasses each and every believer. On the contrary, this actually fortifies the argument. You see, Satan cannot diminish the shield of favor one iota, for he can only affect the earthly blessings associated with it, never the eternal. Remember when the disciples were standing before the council and they said, hey, should we fear you that can harm our body or should we fear God that can deal with our soul? That's the essence of what's being said right here. On one only need to look at the one need only to look at those who overcome Satan to see this. Revelation twelve eleven. They overcame him, Satan, by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death. That's the mindset we're going to have to have, saints. Uh, mind you, we're 
we're, we're looking up and expecting the rapture. However, enemies are rising. They may get to us before the rapture. Are we prepared to die and not rise up against them? Oh, that's hard for an ex-military man. You know, former, I was in the Army for 20 years. Airborne Ranger, jumped out of airplanes, did all that fun stuff, sapper and all that good stuff, yeah. Oh, yeah, aren't you special? No. Because in the midst of that, God got a hold of me and said, hey, you're going to do things my way or the world's way? And I said, I want to do them your way. And now he's showing me, look, that's not the way. The way is stand down and look up. Now, some might argue and say, hey, but, but we've had all these, these wars, you know, these just wars uh, uh, that, that have served great purposes. The Revolutionary War and Civil War was fought over slavery. And, you know, then the World War I, uh, the evil was conquering and World War II, evil was conquering. Yes, it was. And guess what? In that time, I'm sure God said to people, get after them. Because they weren't in this time. They weren't in this end time when we are right on the threshold of the coming of our Lord. Where were the wars I just mentioned all happened before Israel became a nation. Now with that fulfilled, all the other prophecies are fulfilled that, would, that must precede the Lord's coming, the second coming. I'm not talking about the rapture. The rapture could have happened at any time. That's what we believe that eminence means. Paul even believed it could have happened in his day. But the second coming could not happen because God set in stone in his word exactly what the Jews need to do to be saved during that tribulation. Another study for another day. But those that overcome Satan will do so by the blood of the Lamb, which has already been shed, and by the word of their testimony to that fact, and they love not their lives to the death. Are oh, you going to renounce Christ? Are oh, you going to give it up? No. Okay, you're going to die. Oh, but we're not going to do it today. We're going to do it in so many days. And we're going to keep asking you this question. And they're going to pressure and try to force, conjo what's the word? Conjole? Is that the right word? Try to uh, even beguile you. And guess what? They're going to have forces that are mighty in these arts. They're going to be wicked beyond belief. So, back to the article. This mindset is exactly what we see in the narrative of Job, in which a type and shadow may be discerned. God informed Satan that he could, not, he could touch all that pertained to Job, but he could not kill him. Since we now live in the dispensations of, of grace, the only life Satan can destroy is the one that we live in the flesh. He cannot harm the new creature in Christ, who at physical death is immediately in the presence of Christ. So the same situation, you can't kill him. You, guess what? You can't kill them. Because they're mine already. Done deal. 2 Corinthians 5, 6, and 8. Therefore, we are always confident, knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. This knowing is truly our shield of favor. For the believer is comforted by the fact that no matter what the enemy has in store, regardless of the intensity of the assault on our shield of favor, trust in Christ provides assurance of eternal favor in the presence of the Lord. See, stop in the article for a second. Satan's whole game is to get you to curse God. To disbelieve God. So he might turn up the heat. Turn it, turn it up a notch and make things even worse. Don't ever, don't ever, never, ever, ever, ever fall for that lie. Oh, you can be as God. First lie. Praise God. For the Lord Himself, 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17, shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we, what's that say? Ever be with the Lord. Ever and ever and ever and ever. Might I suggest one additional point to consider? Perhaps God is allowing this attack because he is about to send his son Jesus for the bride. And in his great mercy, 
He is trying to prepare the bride for departure while simultaneously creating an environment that encourages the lost to accept through faith his free gift of grace, which results in salvation. Think about this for a second. Each group here mentioned is currently living on earth and God is trying to make sure they are not looking to physical circumstances as their saving grace. God's saying to the saved, I'm not in the article for a moment. He's saying to the saved, look up. He's saying to the world, renounce that old way. Come to me. I'll give, I, will, I will give you rest. Come to me. I'll make you a new creature. Come to me. I'll give you a place in heaven. Come to me. Forsake your old man. Put on the... Come to me. Back to the article. One could speculate that because Satan rejected God after believing his own lie, that he would exalt his throne above, God, above the stars of God and be like the Most High, that he can no longer see the desire of the eternal favor of God, it, that it is more important than the temporal. Maybe he can't see that anymore. He convinced himself that God's not greater. So why would he look to eternal things? Blessings of God like we do. He can't see it. He blinded himself. Blinded by the lie. He blinded himself. After all, when, when he sought to cause, cause Job to curse God to his face, he went after the things that pertain to the flesh. However, Job, though greatly affected by the tragedy, never lost sight of the most important thing. God is God and the faithful will serve him through thick and thin. Perhaps the greatest irony of all is that Satan is attacking the things which cause the desire cause one to desire to continue to inhabit the earth without realizing he is attacking the very things God is trying to get people to let go of in the first place. For this earth is not our home. The author of Hebrews made this clear in his testimony about faithful Abraham, who believed that even though we sojourn here on earth for a season, we are to be looking for a city whose builder and maker is God. Hebrews 11, 8 and 10. By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive as an inheritance, obeyed. And he went out, not knowing whither he went. By faith, he sojourned in the land of promise as in a strange country dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, with the, the heirs with him and the, of the same promise. For he looked for a city which had foundations, whose builder and maker is God. And we look for the same city. This is not an earthly city he's talking about here. He's talking about that heavenly city, that new Jerusalem that's going to come down from heaven. Remember we studied that in the book of Revelation. As outlined in previous articles, soon God will initiate the day of the Lord, which begins with the rapture. During this time period, His great vengeance will be poured out upon the ungodly. Because this will happen very soon, God is warning His children to turn from the message of the false prophets, who are calling for an uprising, which is intended to right the wrongs of the world and turn their attention toward the soon coming King, Jesus, thus making room for his vengeance. We talked about that last week. In concluding, the great psalmist David said, Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivereth him out of them all. Psalm 34, 19. This statement is profound in that knowing the Lord will deliver the righteous out of every affliction is the true shield of favor, which encompasses those who believe and follow the Lord's commandments. For Job, to the, from Job to the patriarchs to the early church leaders all the way down to you and me, God has made it clear that He is for us. And if He is for us, who can be against us? Romans 8.31 In this case, we can rest assured that He has our eternal interest in mind and He is working all things to our good. Romans 8.28 With all of this in mind, let us be like the Apostle Paul who after receiving word that God would not remove his thorn, said this, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, 9 and 10, Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake, for when I am weak, then I am strong. 
Praise God. See, Paul, I believe, learned lessons from studying Job. Remember, he often quoted, and the other, the apostles, quoted Scripture. They learned from what, remember, when the apostles said, hey, we need to appoint deacons, people to take care of the daily machinations, so we can do what? Pray and study God's Word. Because guess what God was going to use them to do? Write the New Testament. And in it, they included many things from the old. So I believe Paul understood by Job's actions that these infirmities, these things that came against him actually made him stronger in the Lord, not weaker. Stronger where? In the Lord. Not in himself, puffed up my... Because when those things come against our body, guess what happens? We become weak. But God becomes strong. We sing about that. When I am weak, I can know that you are strong. You are with me all along. See, he will never leave us nor forsake us. He is our shield of favor. Trusting in him is what puts us behind the shield where no one can touch that eternal man. Amen. Are you blessed? Love you dearly. May the Lord be with you.